my PhD itself is. It uh, you know, very much starts from the economic problems that we face. It does some class analysis at the beginning, and then it moves from that into an analysis of democracy and of existing political movements in the United States, the left, the right, and the center, anchoring the left around Bernie, the right around Trump, and the center around Biden, since that was what was going on when this book was written. Uh, and then uh, as, it, as it moves through, we have this unsolvable economic problem, which I think we have, we can't solve it with political means. So then what do we do socially, culturally, politically, because we can't solve this problem? What are the effects of the fact that the problem remains unsolved? That really is what drives the second half of the book. I talk about how we try to imagine new terms for ourselves, but those terms don't take us anywhere. I talk about some of the other things we try to do to avoid having to think about politics, but politics comes for us. It finds us in those places and it makes a mess of them. And then I talk about, uh, you know, uh, in part because there's such a tendency in social science for people to end with a, a pat solution. I do a chapter kind of picking at that whole idea that books have to end with some kind of positive solution. And I do, a, I, I kind of run through a few different uh, possible things you could do and all the terrible things that would happen to you as you try to do those things, all the stuff that would go wrong. You know, it's really, it's, it's six chapters. It's pretty quick and breezy compared to a lot of things I, I'd like to think. I'm just so flattered that you guys are, are actually sitting down to do this. This is really, yeah, it's a huge compliment to me. And you didn't even like ask me to lead it or anything. You guys are just doing it spontaneously <laughs> of your own accord. It's so kind. Uh, so yeah. I'm definitely going to enjoy listening to as much of it as I possibly can. I'm fascinated to hear you guys talk about it without me having to tell you exactly what to think. So I'm I'm going to try not to say too much more about what it all says because I don't want to overdetermine how you interpret me. Mm. So have fun with it. Thank you so much, Benjamin. Uh, again, I thank you for all you've done, uh, all you've brought to Theory Underground, all you've added. Uh, thank you for being just so gracious, gracious and and kind, uh, and and. Uh, a ray of sunshine, but I'm not saying that disparagingly. Like you really do kind of brighten up um, wherever you are. So thank you for all that. Um, and yeah, Sean is, like I said, I think Sean's the captain of this ship. So um, yeah. It's, uh, yeah, thanks for, uh, yeah, I have to echo what Nan said. Thanks for, thanks for coming, this, uh, Benjamin. This is a, uh... Fabulous surprise to have you here. So, uh, but yeah, you, and and props for such a great title. I mean, it's really it's really a good hook. So, well, you guys um, are brightening me up just by doing this. So you're doing at least as much for me here today as I'm sure I'm doing for you. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Yeah, yeah. So I guess I'll I'll share my screen and then uh, I'll scroll as we as we go. Yeah. Well, work, right? um, if now if if you. People in the call, if you guys don't have a copy of the PDF, hopefully we'll, it'll be legible with the sh screen share. Um, but I hope everyone has a PDF or a physical copy of, of the book um, so we can uh, read along and, and keep a pace with each other. Um, it might be legible on the screen if you, if you share it and if, you, if we maximize it. Let's see what happens. Do I do? Let's do Chrome tab. Sorry, I'm uh, working out the bug because I've never, never used this before. Um, on the job, on the job, not training, but on the job learning, or rather, on the, like, in situ, learning. Um, we right. learn as we go. Indeed. I don't know how to share. I think I'm just going to share my entire screen because I don't know how to share just the PDF I have open. I don't think that's going to um, You so. should be able to, when you click share screen, you can click applications and then you can choose or you can just go straight to screen. Just make sure um, you're prepared to share your full desktop screen. Oh, yeah, there's nothing weird on here. <laughs> the, the thing that 
uh, notifications. I don't know if you have desktop notifications, but sometimes that'll have like personal information. Oh yeah, it's like not my laptop. And... Oh cool. It might Perfect. show from because it's not my computer. It might show my roommate's fucking text, so I probably shouldn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point. How do I um, share? Okay, I don't know how to just this. So when you click though. share screen down in the bottom, uh, click applications. And if you have it open in a Chrome browser, you can select Google Chrome and then it'll just blast whatever, like whatever tab is open in that Chrome. I have the, I have the PDF downloaded, so I don't know if I can, that's what I mean. I what do you I use to read PDFs? Uh, again, it's a, uh, not my computer. So right. I'm a little bit. Is, is... <laughs> You're not. It's okay. Is the PDF <laughs> open right now? It is. It is. It is okay. Indeed. What program is that open in? Good question. Um, what program is this? It's just a file. I don't know what. Uh... Okay. So when you click on yeah. share screen and in the applications tab, oh. do you see it? If you scroll down? No, I do not. Okay, hold on a second. Let me think. I know, I'm trying to think how to do this. Sorry, I tried to get here 15 minutes early, but then my audio wasn't working, so I spent that time doing that. It's all right, man. We're, we're under no, uh, no pressure. We are the conditions of possibility. Everyone that's here is the conditions of possibility for this happening, so it's, it's an implicit agreement that we can take as long as we need to take. Um, how do I open it in something else? So go to your the download. Go to your file and like right click and like open with. Open with oh there you go. And if you can open with Chrome or Safari or whatever, and then um there is that'll work better. Hell yeah. Okay. Now I go shit. Oh, I need to get it open too. Hold on, don't start yet, dude. <laughs> there we go. I got it. Did everyone see this? Did it work? Um, everyone, you should have to click watch stream in the window. Um, and then it should full screen it. And it's looking good on my end. How's everybody else? This is good. Yep. Sick. Whoa. Yeah. Let's let's not do that. Uh oh. Uh -oh. Get out uh -oh. of All right. <clears throat> Excuse me. God damn. How do I get out of this present thing that I just opened? Oh here we go. I just got it. Aha. Uh -huh. That look good for everybody? Simone. <clears throat> Working? Yep. Awesome. Okay. I guess we'll get started. Do do we want to do like a three paragraphs each and then switch? Yeah. Um what what is the kind of group consensus? Again, uh I think we aim to do like yeah. seventy 327% as far as letting the, the text speak for itself and then our interjections. We prefer the majority of the time very, to be spent on the precise. book. Well, it's because yeah. uh, Pareto, the 80-20 Pareto was a fascist, so we can't do the 80-20 rule. So we had, <laughs> we had to come up with something else. Um, so just again, the, the majority of the time we want to make sure that the text is, is speaking for itself. We want to come in and do interjections with um, pertinent questions. Um, it is inevitable that we will derail. That's what we do. We are people. Uh, we can't help but derail. And it's okay as long as we're aware of it, we're, we catch it, we get back on track. Um, and it, it does uh, tend to work best with like a three or four paragraph puff puff pass type thing. So like, I guess whatever everyone's comfortable with, um, we'll go from there and then 
again, Sean, you being the captain here, uh, it is up to you. You can tell us what to do and, and we'll do it. Um, we are eagerly waiting your yeah. commands. <laughs> It's gonna be too much power. I like it. Uh, <laughs> let's do. Let's just. I'm just gonna say. Let's do four paragraphs each, and then switch. About that, and uh, I'll start is if everyone's ready. Okay. So introduction. The American political establishment takes the crisis of American democracy too seriously, but also not seriously enough. Many writers sound the alarm, warning about American democracy's impending fall. They argue for different kinds of political reforms, all aimed at preventing populist demagogues from polarizing Americans along ethnic and cultural lines and manipulating the legal system to authoritarian ends. For Stephen Levitsky and Daniel Ziblatt, the bulk of the Republican Party is behaving in an anti-democratic manner. They think the problem is a lack of gatekeeping. Today's politicians can use the internet and cable television to reach voters directly without going through establishment mediators. The primary system makes the political parties vulnerable to infiltration. But why do Americans gravitate towards the messages they hear on the internet and on TV? Why has the public trust in so many elite institutions fallen to historic lows? The American elite is uncomfortable confronting the role it has played in alienating people. It shocks the crisis up to the spread of hate, to the spread of fake news, to the algorithms used by search engines and social media companies. But is this explanation really true? And even so far as it is true, there's still a question of the why. Why are Americans attracted to hateful messaging in the first place? Why do they believe fake news? Only a few years ago, it was possible in the United States to talk about the effects of the economy on democracy and culture. Mainstream liberal economists used to talk about this. In 2013, Joseph Stieglitz, who, who served as the chairman of President Clinton's Council of Economic Advisors in the 1990s, argued that democracy is in trouble because, as our economic system is seen to fail for most citizens, and as our political system seems to be captured by a moneyed interest, confidence in our democracy and in the market economy will erode along with our global influence. As the reality sinks in that we are no longer a country of opportunity and that even long the, our long vaunted rule of law and system of justice have been compromised, even our sense of national identity may be put into jeopardy. Who wants to, whoever wants to go next, just go ahead and jump in. Four paragraphs. I'll go for it. Okay, can you hear me? Okay, great. Stieglitz argued not only that the American economy was failing the American people, but that this failure would have political and cultural consequences. The problem for Stieglitz was globalization. He didn't think globalization was intrinsically bad. It was just that, quote, governments are managing it so poorly, unquote. A handful of Americans made similar, similar arguments. But things shifted after the 2016 election. Both party establishments were challenged by Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders. Each advanced a critique of the American economy. In response, much of the American elite closed ranks. Acknowledging the seriousness of economic problems and the role they, play, they played in fueling resentment gave aid and comfort to the populists. It was necessary for elites to find a way to explain populism without engaging with the economic context in which it arose. This was accomplished by setting up a dichotomy between economic and cultural explanations for President Trump's victory. It was either due to economic insecurity or cultural backlash. American political scientists looked at the income level of Trump voters. They argued that because many Trump voters were not personally economically insecure, economic factors could not be responsible for his victory. It had to be cultural rather than class. But the economy and the culture do not exist in separate universes. The economy affects the culture. Voters don't have to personally experience economic precarity to feel that the economic system is unfair, that the political class is corrupt. They may think the economy has been rigged by greedy, decadent, hateful elites. They may think those elites are the product of a debased culture. They may look for cultural solutions to economic problems. 
if you talk about the economic problems, you get accused of legitimizing the grievances of the populace, of aiding and abetting the bad people. To avoid this, American elites have increasingly become trapped in an insular cultural discussion. They are too busy denouncing the deplorables to make any effort to properly understand the problem or respond to it. This denial of economic reality makes elites look out of touch. Ironically, it fuels the very resentments that drive populism forward. I'll do this paragraph and then someone can pick it up uh, at the quote. Um, it's different in Britain and Europe. Discussion of the structural problems with the global economic system still flourishes in the old world. There are still deep, complex narratives that bring economic and political analysis together. French economist Thomas Piketty argues that economic change has undermined democracy by damaging the sense that the economy operates in a meritocratic way. All I can think so far is that um, the political establishment has learned absolutely nothing. Uh, <laughs> like reflecting, <laughs> reflecting on this election, like this is t correct, I believe, in that it's just nothing has changed at all. It's still florables versus in like using to acknowledge economic reasons, which Trump won because of inflation. That's that's why Trump won. You know, I, I you're right. But I also recently have found myself wondering how much did Trump win and how much did the Democrats just lose it? Um, true, true. But but it is it is yeah, a case that they, like they lost due to this shit. Um, and like, I mean, I lived yeah. through, I lived through Bill Clinton when there seemed to be like, at least this performative push back to a populism. Um, but since, uh, since Al Gore, it seems like the, the Dems have been, uh, populism has been like anathema to the, mm -hmm. the liberal or progressive wing of our duopoly. Um, but maybe, I don't know, maybe I'm missing something. Well, I just think it's remarkable how, um, suspicious a lot of self-identified leftists are when you want to talk about class at all yeah. or economics at all right it's it's straight so far into the conversation around culture like yeah yeah the only thing you can say is like you can you can be like oh the economy is so bad people are hurting of course regardless of how the economy is doing <laughs> um but if you actually want to talk about like whether any of the reactionary sentiment um that's fueling the right has any economic basis like you've already lost people and you've already like identified yourself as a reactionary by like wanting to understand reactionaries essentially mm. yeah it's shame yeah, and, yeah like like the i mean people are seeing like about nance what you said about like uh the democrats lost it like uh people are gonna see through the fact that you're using a couple social wedge issues over mm -hmm. and over again as like a blackmail you're basically it's a protection racket like nice bodily autonomy it'd be a shame it'd be a you know shame if anything happened to it you know what i mean like eventually people are gonna see through that shit and they're not gonna put up with it and they're just gonna be like i don't care i don't care that you're holding this over my head like abortion rights you know and that's what yeah. they've been doing for and it stopped working like and it's of course it is because people are it's not going to work forever you know people are going to see through it mm. yeah but it is frightening there's still something in me that wants the comfort of uh of a healthy political system so um sure yeah yeah i feel that too at the same time yeah mm -hmm. shall we uh, uh shall we keep on going let's let's roll 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 um our democratic societies rest on a meritocratic worldview, or at any rate, a meritocratic hope. By which I mean a belief in a society in which inequality is based more on merit and effort than on kinship and rents. This belief and this hope play a very crucial role in modern society for a simple reason. In a democracy, the professed equality of rights of all citizens contrasts sharply with the very real inequality of living conditions. And in order to overcome this contradiction, it is vital to make sure that social inequalities derive from rational and universal principles 
rather than arbitrary contingencies. British political economist Helen Thompson describes a process of deindustrialization and financialization that ends in cultural conflicts about the meaning of citizenship. Open international capital flows and new trade agreements made it easier for North American and European manufacturing corporations to offshore jobs to countries where labor costs were lower, and highly internationalized financial sector, sector, <laughs> sectors concentrated wealth more intensely. Everywhere, democracies became, became, from the 1990s, increasingly unresponsive to democratic demands for economic reforms that would increase the return to labor. Under these conditions, democracies became particularly susceptible to their plutocratic tendencies and more difficult to reform. In the case of the American Republic, this turn fueled wider conflicts around democratic citizenship. For political economist Andrew Gamble, the United States is mired in a structural crisis in which there are long-term and persistent deadlocks and impasses from which there appears to be no exit, and which lead to repeated short-term crises. If the economy is at the root of the crisis of American democracy and the economy cannot easily be reformed, the crisis cannot easily be solved. This book takes the crisis of American democracy seriously, not by trying to terrify you about populism, but by engaging with its causes. It's a work of political theory, drawing on existing works of political economy. The first half of the book describes the current situation. The rest of the chapter lays out the economic context that, derive, that drives the crisis forward. Chapter 2 explores the different ways different American factions have tried and failed to politically respond to the crisis in recent years, focusing on the cultural consequences of these failures. Chapter 3 offers a new theory of crisis suited to the situation described in the first two chapters. The second half of the book focuses on how the crisis may develop going forward. Chapter 4 theorizes about how American political ideas are evolving in response to the crisis. Chapter 5 explores what Americans will do to cope if the crisis continues unabated. Finally, Chapter 6 considers whether there is a way out. At the end of that chapter, you'll find an epilogue. It includes an extended discussion of how this book came to be written. Who wants to take up the competitive global econom economy and its consequences? I'll go for a bit. Oh. Oh. Often, when people talk about changes to the American economy, they talk about globalization. We are told we are in a competitive global economy. In practice, this means that there has been an enormous increase in the mobility of capital. It has become much easier for companies to move their operations from country to country. Increasingly, governments compete with each other to attract jobs and investment, and this competition creates powerful incentives to make policy that is friendly to wealthy individuals and transnational corporations. How did capital become so mobile? Over the past several decades, governments have encouraged trade by lowering trade barriers. Tariffs, taxes on imports, have fallen dramatically. In 1970, the ratio of tariffs to imports was nearly five times higher than it was in 2017. Between 1970 and 2021, trade increased as a percentage of U.S. GDP from 11 to 25 percent. When people think about the expansion of trade, they often think about outsourcing, companies moving jobs abroad. Outsourcing has eliminated some jobs. An estimated 3.7 million American jobs were lost due to the trade deficit with China between 2001 and 2018. But this is only one small part of the picture. Because companies can credibly threaten to relocate, government economic policy caters to them. The government worries about job losses and it makes a point to limit them. Because of this, the problem is not so much the jobs we lose, it's the things the government does to keep the ones we have. To attract jobs and investment, our government stifles wage growth. It keeps the minimum, minimum wage down and it weakens the bargaining power of unions. The real inflation-adjusted federal minimum wage was over $12 an hour in 1970. Today, it's stuck at $7.25. In 1960, over 30% of American workers were in unions. Today, that figure is 
Between 1979 and 2019, inflation-adjusted wages grew just 8%, while overall GDP rose by 760%. Technological changes reinforce those trends. The internet makes it easier for more work to be done remotely, making it simpler for companies to move their operations around. Automation allows companies to expand produ production without creating jobs or raising wages. Over the past 50 years, productivity increases have become completely detached from wage growth. Capital mobility doesn't just affect wage policy. It also affects the tax system. It's estimated that wealthy people have stashed between $24 trillion and $36 trillion in off offshore tax havens. But that's just the tip of the iceberg. Again, it's not about the revenue we lose. It's about the things we do to avoid losing revenue. Over the past 50 years, the government has filled the tax code with loopholes, undermining the statutory corporate tax rate. Taxes on corporate income fell from almost 32% of corporate profits in 1970 to just 10% in 2019. U.S. states have cut their income tax rates to compete with their neighbors, and they sometimes even use tax revenue to pay companies to come to town. Nine states are currently without a state income tax altogether. And on top of this, states and municipalities give away an estimated annual $45 billion to $70 billion in subsidies. I love when a, like a national level politician like says that, like, uh, look, if we increase taxes on corporations, they're just going to send the jobs overseas. And I'm like, I mean, it's one thing for a local level politician to say that. But when like a federal level politician says that, I'm like, you're the state. Don't let them do that. Like, like, have you forgotten that you're the state? Like, you know what I mean? Like, uh, I, I just never, it just drives me crazy. I'm like, I feel like you're in charge. <laughs> you people I feel are like in the, charge. This election cycle, like a lot of people will talk about how like oh, the Kamala Harris campaign, they didn't run on policy. It's like it's just pure culture war now or whatever. But even beyond, I feel like back before 2016, and maybe I'm just remembering, just misremembering things because I'm younger. I feel like there's even less like talk about just basic civics and how the government even functions in like media, mainstream, r regular new like as far as like because there's not any policy to talk about, so they don't even try to. Like, I remember there used to be a lot of um, discussion about, like, I guess the last big thing was uh, there was a lot of, like, policy wonk kind of discussion about, like, the stuffing the courts. Mm -hmm. And, but, but, and, 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 and I guess I don't want to get too off topic. I'm, just, that's just something that I was just thinking about in what, off of what you were just saying, anyways. <laughs> Mm -hmm. like yeah, we're not even uh, <laughs> a moment that stuck out to me around what you were saying, Sean, about the like, you are the state was like Kamala Harris, like in the early days of the pandemic, like retweeted or whatever platform, um, this like fundraiser, like a GoFundMe for uh, like servers who had lost wages. And again, it's like, you could make a social safety net like we shouldn't be all throwing a couple shekels together here like this is the role of the state you you are the state and here you are like being like oh these you know these servers have nothing since they're suddenly out of work it's like why is that Kamala why is that but it's yeah it's it's kind of remarkable that she can do that and receive I, don't, I think pretty little criticism outside of like some snarky comments on Instagram. Yeah. Yeah. Can, uh, yeah. Hear, hear me all right? Yeah, I can hear you. We can. Um, I think it, it also makes me think of the rather facile way uh, we often understand class interests. Um, I think most workers are aware that um, state doesn't want to intervene on their behalf to uh, uh, obfuscate uh, capital flight. And so if they are aware of that, then they will be like, well, I know that the state can't keep 
uh, you know, my company from offshoring my job. Um, so the state better keep taxes low or do everything they can to keep my job, even if it means I will get lower wages. So I think there's a way in which workers kind of actually do make a, um, they end up, I guess, aligning their interests with that of their company because they're aware the state's not going to do anything for them. So yeah, the state might as well do everything to uh, ensure that my company will not offshore my job. Yeah. You know, and it's, it's yeah, very, you my, know, it's. That's my reading of like why Trump won is that like, um, I mean, there are some other factors, sure, but the dominant reason, as far as I can tell, is that like, it, and this is why this book is still relevant, even though it was written during like kind of the Bernie era, is that like, it's because we don't have social democracy of any kind that that's unavailable, that's off the table at this point. That's why the only economic game we can play is about inflation. Like, that's the only thing we can do. So, like, if people are going to vote on any economic reason when when social democracy of any kind is off the table, then it's like, well, yeah, they're going to vote to reduce inflation because they were always voting for economic reasons. Hopefully that made sense. But uh, who wants to do the anyone else want to do the next one? I can do it if no one if no one's ready yet. Do Has we... anyone not gone who wants to go? There we go. Let's make sure everybody that's here gets a go. Yeah. yeah. I can't even see who's here. So, I, yeah, I'm like just looking at the. I can go. Yeah, it's, it's short. Oh. Um, revenue becomes tighter and tighter. States are forced to chip away at the quality of their public services. Across the country, average inflation adjusted teacher salaries fell 4.5% between 2010 and 2019. Teacher salaries in 2019 were 19.2% lower than those of comparably educated workers, and that leads to shortages. Many states try to staunch the bleeding by raising sales taxes and sin taxes, shifting the burden of supporting public services onto the backs of ordinary working people. In 2016, Ted Cruz even proposed a federal sales tax as an alternative to the entire federal income tax system. With such weak wage growth, how can Americans buy enough to support the economy? With a shrieking tax base, how can the government pay for infrastructure and essential services? More money to buy more goods and services. If they aren't getting that money from wage growth, they have to get it some other way. Sociologist Wolfgang Streak outlines three different ways governments have tried to make up for persistently low wage growth. First, in the 1980s, the federal government ran up large deficits, propping up consumption by continuing to fund public services at a level beyond what revenue would support. In the 1990s, the size of the deficit became worrying. And the government instead began encouraging its citizens to borrow excessively large amounts of money, culminating in the subprime mortgage debacle of 2008. At this point, governments resorted to quantitative easing. As Street puts it, today's political fix is called quantitative easing, essentially the printing of money by treasuries and central banks to keep interest rates down and accumulated debt sustainable as well as prevent a stagnant economy from sliding, sliding into deflation at the price of more inequality and of new bubbles in assets, markets, building, and eventually collapsing. Uh, indeed, economic inequality has soared. Uh, the ordinary person has to try to find a way to navigate this increasingly precarious world, but there is no easy path in the 21st century and most of the life paths available to people are likely to end in deep resentment. Let's explore how three different classes experience this new kind of economy, the workers, the professionals, and the employers. This schema purposefully simplifies things. Other factors apart from class, like cultural identity, influence any given person's experience of economic change and the set of political solutions to which they might 
subtracted. But by starting with economic class, we can more clearly see how the competitive global economy directly affects people's lives. Subsequent chapters will more directly address the cultural consequences of the crisis. If we want to take a minute to just look at the table for ourselves. So let's uh, table 1.1, 1. 1, rising economic inequality, 1971 through 2021. Percentile and year, bottom 50% share of pre-tax national income. In 1971, it was 20.4%. In 2021, it was 13.6%. Top 1% share of pre-tax national income. 1971, it was 11.1%. 2021, it was 19.1%. Bottom 50% share of net personal wealth. 71, it's 2.3. 21, it's 1.5. And top 1% share of net personal wealth. 71, it's 26.3. 21, it's 34.9. So I'm dumb, but looking at this table, it seems to me like things have only gotten worse. Uh I'm not the, the most smartest mathematician guy, but I think that's what those numbers mean. It seems to be the case that the poor got poorer, the rich got richer. And significantly so, right? Like in the line that's talking about the top 1% share of pre-tax national income, it went from 11% to 19%. So it is very close to double. It's doubling, yeah. Right. Isn't it? Isn't what sh like in Pennsylvania? It was a hedge fund manager who won like a house seat. I think it was one of the congressional seats in Pennsylvania. Like uh, a, a hedge fund. This manager. time around. Yeah. Oh, wow! That's sh shocking. I'm pretty that's... sure I'm not. Well, I'm not paying any attention, so you're probably right. But that's shocking, dude. PA yeah. has. PA has a pretty strong, like, populist uh, uh, pull. Yeah. So for them to elect yeah, a like, hedge fund guy, it's pretty gnarly. But look who Trump is. Trump is the guy who will raise your fucking rent. Yeah, Like, dude. that's who Trump is. He's president. And, like, it blows your mind. But it's like, this is, to me, this is like, this is how terrible the Democratic Party is. Like, how incompetent their, their running of elections are is that yeah, a dude. hedge fund manager in a, in a oligarch like a, a, a neo-feudalist oligarch can be you know running our country you know i, I like it's <laughs> it uh i i think it it's very plain to see that there's a lot of resentment with i mean i resent the the left right and i, I resent my former commitments or whatever um but i also wonder like how much of it is is a, a, a resentment where it actually becomes like the people get off on the fact that Trump is like step on me harder. Um, I don't even think, okay, maybe, maybe there's something to that. Like to me, like when I was talking to a coworker at, at work about, uh, about Trump, he was like, well, at least Trump knows how to, I was, I was saying they're total, they're both bad options. I, I don't care about this election is what <laughs> I was telling him. And he was like, and he was like, no, you have to vote because at least like Trump knows how to how to use money, how to like handle money. No, he doesn't. That's dude. exactly like, okay. it. Yeah. <laughs> a, no, he crucial. doesn't. But B, like, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, Kira. No, I, I just wanted to say, like, I think the thing I've heard the most from Trump supporters, not that I've had contact with too many in Canada, but um, is is he's a smart businessman. And I think yeah. when we've gotten to the point where there's no meaningful distinction for people between corporations and the government when that seems to have like merged into one blob then they think that a businessman is who we need in charge yeah. of the government right that's like mm. i think that's like the simplest answer that i hear from people the most frequently is he's yeah. a good business yeah. which he's not but that's besides the point he has the, the image of a good and one it, and to me it's like he's it, it's it's just like this is why i think the democrats are incompetent the fact that they cannot make a better case than that like to me this is just incompetence
dude, here's the deal. Uh, it's not incompetence. Um, no. It is, it's by design. So Benjamin is good on this. Actually, I was kind of like, uh, I was amazed recently the other day, Benjamin was talking about how it's, it's like the, they intentionally don't court uh, populist voters. Like they, they intentionally don't court, you know, left-leaning or progressive values having populists because they don't want to have to do anything. And so they're used to playing this game where it's like we're on a teeter totter and the, they would rather lose than actually have to do anything structural. Um, and like, I'm, I'm a crazy pretty over it or whatever. Right. Like electoralism is yeah. it's, it's a lie. I'm a, I'm a black pill. Look how edgy I am. But like Benjamin, I think might have a more irascible black pill because he will actually go through and kind of like break down, like, no, they intentionally don't do this. Like they're, um, they're complicit. They're not even complicit. Like they are the ones who are stepping on our necks. It's not that they're like just standing by while we get fucked. They are the ones doing the fucking and they're lying to us about it. Um, it's not incompetence, dude. It's, it's intentional. I go back and forth. I've been going back and forth about like, which is it? Is it, is it, is it stupid? I don't know. Like I, like some days I'm like, I think they're evil, like in their fucking like subverting us. And mm. this is part of the plan to lose. Mm -hmm. And then some days I'm like, no, they're idiots. And I can't tell the difference. I think, look, man, the people, the people in the party are, you know, well-meaning, earnest, uh, maybe naive uh, people who, who probably do care a lot, but like the people, planning the people making decisions the people like drawing the map those are those are bad people yeah i saw a thread uh well i guess it's not called a thread on reddit but um <laughs> studebaker made a post in id poll and some people were asking questions and i think studebaker said something to the effect that like the point of this book is to I, he didn't use the term black pill, but it's essentially to like push you to the point where you are past hope and you're past fear um, mm. because like actual despair and being able to like fully acknowledge how completely fucked things are is like where the fertile ground is essentially. So mm. yeah, I agree. I'm in favor of despair. Uh, who, wants to, destitution. who wants to go next? Yeah. <laughs> I think if if Jacob is here handy by his microphone, I think he's the last one that needs to go and then we can uh uh rehit the order. You here Jacob, you ready or uh He might be He might be having some tech issues. Well, I can just go if everyone else is gone and uh, start the cycle again. And then whenever he wants to hop back in, he, he can. You guys hear me? Oh, yep. Yeah, we hear you. Okay, good. Yeah, no, I was just speaking to say uh, that I can't. I'm still working on OBS. I'm not, uh, not there yet. Sorry. Okay. No problem. I'll just go. And then uh, whenever you want to hop in, just feel free. Alrighty. The workers. For our purposes, the workers are the employed people who don't go to college and who answer to a boss. These are the people who, once upon a time, would have worked predominantly in factories and on farms. Many of these jobs have been automated or moved abroad. This has pushed more and more of these workers into, service, into the service sector. Many of them work retail, food service, or hospitality. They are increasingly working in logistics, driving trucks, staffing warehouses, and delivering things. When more workers were in manufacturing, they were able to organize themselves politically with some efficacy. It is very costly to shut down a factory, even for a brief period, and this gave labor unions in the manufacturing sector a lot of leverage. Capital mob mobility took most of this leverage away. It became too easy for companies to move their facilities offshore, and this made labor unions more cautious. As manufacturing continues to employ a diminishing percentage of workers, more of them find themselves in service jobs where the strike is less effective. 
brief disruptions to operations are not as devastating for many companies, and increasingly, self-checkout systems make it easy for shops to stay open with skeleton staffs. I don't know. I don't know. You said the I don't remember. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, even when the will to organize is there, the government has made it it's steadily harder for old unions to survive and for new unions to form. Right to work laws frustrate unions, making it easy for work workers to enjoy the benefits of working in unionized workplaces without having to pay dues. This makes it hard for unions to build up the resources they need to support their members during strikes. And that makes workers more skittish about using what leverage they do have. As union resources and leverage decline, they have fewer successes and their successes fade. They struggle to persuade workers to join and contribute. The unionization rate in the United States fell by more than half between 1980 and 2020. The unions played a pivotal role. Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, you're good. You're good? Okay. Uh, the unions played a pivotal role in politically organizing workers. As they have declined, the quality and quantity of worker political participation has also fallen. Political scientists Jacob Hacker and Paul Pearson argue the biggest political problem for workers is the lack of groups that can, quote, provide a continuing organized capacity, unquote, to both monitor government policy and mobilize workers to respond to it. The unions were the core type of organization that did this work, and no clear replacements have emerged. Without them, it's harder to mobilize workers to vote. It's harder to fund candidates who prioritize workers. And it's harder to get workers accurate information about which candidates prioritize them. This situation understandably makes some workers feel politically futile, but many continue to do their best to understand what's going on. Unfortunately, as the unions decline, the information available to workers increasingly comes from media controlled by other economic classes. Wealthy oligarchs own the television networks and newspapers, and they use them to disseminate perspectives that are friendly to their own interests. While independent media offers an alternative to corporate media, independent media is largely produced by the professional class. The professionals who have college degrees do not always share workers' interests and cannot be relied upon to put them first. This leads some workers to reject both corporate and independent media, preferring instead to indulge in conspiracy theories. Statistically, lower levels of education heavily predict a person's propensity to believe in conspiracy. While conspiracy theories are often mocked by oligarchs and professionals, they are a way of trying to understand what much of the corporate and independent media refuse to explain, why the country is becoming increasingly cruel and unfair to working people. Workers who engage in conspiracy theories do not understand the changes, but they are at least trying to understand. At least they are able to recognize that corporate and independent media are not principally interested in helping them. Unfortunately, the conspiracy theories are no more helpful than much of the rest of the media. The, worker experience, the workers experience the brunt of the pain and suffering caused by the changes to our economic system, and they resent the fact that politicians never do much to improve their situation. But resentment in the absence of solid information is easy to misdirect. In their quest to understand what's going on, the workers are repeatedly pushed to blame various groups of people for changes that remain fundamentally opaque to them. While some oligarchs and professionals encourage the workers to blame outgroups, other oligarchs and professionals accuse these same workers of being hateful and bigoted. In this way, the workers are pushed to adopt perspectives that marginalize them further from mainstream politics. The more the workers are induced to adopt hateful frames, the easier it is to justify and perpetuate their lack of influence. It's a, it's a vicious cycle of marginalization in which a vulnerable population is repeatedly toyed with by people in positions of power and influence. There is, of course, one other option available to the workers. They can try to stop being workers. They can try to become professionals or employers, but this is not easy to do and these classes face their own predicaments. <sighs> okay. <laughs> you have something to say there, Kier? <laughs> <laughs>
Oh man, I mean, I am the worker who's trying to claw my way uh, into something mm. that looks like a profession from the outside. Mm. Um, I just, I, fi- I feel so frustrated about the ways that like, mostly like white working class people and mostly white working class men are just like detested by a lot of self-identified leftists like they're grouped as this just horrifically racist and misogynist bunch of people um who have like no political potential and they're like beyond saving like it's not even worth like talking to them because they're so far gone and that just yeah that makes me it's it's exactly what's being described here and it's um it's being done by professionals and it's it's really infuriating and it doesn't hold up to um my experience with uh working people (laughs) um and i i don't know i wonder I don't think, but I hope that maybe the conversation will shift because um, Trump picked up the black working class and the Latino working class this election. So these simplified explanations that working people are just these stupid assholes um, maybe will be harder to hold by these intersectional feminists, but we'll see. Or will they just double down even more? I don't know. Fuck. Internalized white supremacy. Ooh. <laughs> the professionals. For our purposes, the professionals have college degrees, but they still answer to bosses or clients. They still rely on a wage, be it a salary or an hourly rate, for the bulk of their income. As conditions grew more difficult for workers over the past few decades, education was increasingly pitched as a reliable way out. More and more people went to college. In 1970, less than 17% of Americans between the ages of 25 and 29 had a college degree. By 2021, that figure increased to 39%. But as we've discussed, inflation-adjusted wages haven't been rising much. Even as the workforce becomes more educated, its wages stagnate. This means that while today's professionals do earn more money than today's workers, they aren't earning dramatically more money than the workers of yesterday. Social mobility in in the United States declined substantially after 1980, both intergenerationally and within one lifespan. More people aren't earning more money than their parents or their younger selves, even though they are often more educated than their parents and their younger selves. A third of college graduates, and nearly 40% of recent graduates, work in jobs that straightforwardly do not require a college degree. As the number of college graduates increases, More and more jobs require degrees simply as a means of thinning their applicant pools. In a 2013 study, only 27% of college graduates were found to end up in jobs related to their college major. Increasingly, people have to go to college simply because other people are going to college, and employers will choose the people who have been to college over the people who haven't. This is a costly distinction to obtain. Between sorry, 19... Nance, I... Yeah. Uh, there was a... I just have to... On that, I just have to... Really quick. There was a fucking... Uh, I, I was delivering for FedEx, mm-hmm. and uh, I delivered to, a, like, a like a Les Schwab or something, and then the, the, o- the manager of the Les Schwab, or the owner, was like... Uh, franchise owner was like, hey, uh, y- y- are you happy where you're working? And I was like, <laughs> it's fine, I guess. And then he was like, <laughs> do you have a college? And I was like, yeah, I have a fucking bachelor's, I guess. And, uh, and he was like, uh, you should come work for me. I'll pay you $70,000 a year. He was like, I just need someone with a college degree. I was like, why? <laughs> like, why? Why? <laughs> like, what, what does having a liberal arts degree help me any more than the workers you already, like, have? 
working there at managing a fucking Les Schwab. Like, what the? F- I was so confused. I was like, it's... why would you give me that money? Why would you not promote one of your workers to that position? I'm so bad. It's an implicit. <laughs> it's it's an implicit acknowledgement of what the education system does and what it's designed to do. It is designed to instrumentalize you in this way. Uh, and it's great. You can, it like, we should be socialized and we should be subjectivized and we should understand how to like go with the flow and, f- and we should understand group dynamics. And that's pretty much all that school does anymore. But it is like, yeah. they are saying like, yeah, it doesn't matter. Like you're not getting anything useful from the schooling system other than having your fucking spirit broken. It's like breaking wild horses. Like it, it is this like implicit yeah. recognition yeah. and understanding of the fact that like we are humans, we are wild, we are free. And then we go through these very expensive, very drawn out processes of subjectification and stratification and fucking all the agations. Um, and we become good little workers, but that, yeah, that is what it is, dude. It's, it's, it sucks and it uh is only getting worse only getting worse sorry only that. getting worse um between 19 yeah i i, oh. I it's really really oh i was just gonna say yeah I, in terms of a liberal arts education i think they see it they see a ba they, they don't care about the specific content of what you study they just care about the forms uh, that you absorbed as someone who graduated college. They assume that you're going to be someone, when you meet with a client, you're going to speak a certain way. You're going to have a certain vocabulary. But, you know, they it's really about all these things that are... almost seem like uh, byproducts of a college of education, but are, in fact, the main reason employers uh see that as a benefit to them mm. um which is a very backwards way of looking at education because um it is yeah the pure instrumentalization of education i don't care about any specific thing you learn i just want you to have had the sociocultural education that you know any ba and that's that's significantly less useful if more people have it. Mm. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Well, and workers like myself talk like cavemen, right? So we can't be trusted to, <laughs> you know, perform basic tasks. Ooga booga. Fucking. <laughs> uh, ooga booga, motherfucker. Um. Between 1975 and 2021, the cost of tuition and fees at four-year public colleges multiplied almost 40, 40, 40 times over, while the cost of four-year private colleges multiplied almost 15 times over. Student debt exploded. In 2021 dollars, the average graduate in 1975 owed just $5,060. Today, the average graduate owes $31,100. If we exclude the 17% of graduates who manage to avoid debt entirely, the average borrower owes $37,113. President Biden has recently tried to forgive some of this debt, but tuition continues to rise, and every year millions of students take on ever larger debts. This results in a kind of indentured servitude. Graduates must acquire enormous debts just for the privilege of earning wages in line with what workers earned in the 1970s. Once they graduate, these debts force them to take whatever jobs are readily available. Only a small minority manage to find careers in their major. The effect of this debt burden on young people is hard to overstate. In 2019, millennials held only 3% of American wealth. Damn, son. When baby boomers were the same age, they held 21%. Their share was 7% times larger seven 
Often, graduates are forced to travel very far away from home in search of a way to pay down their debts. A full 77% of college graduates have moved communities, and only 24% of those mover graduates say that home is where they live now. This forced migration makes it harder for young adults to make friends and form social ties. Among millennials, 30% always or often feel lonely. 53% have fewer than five friends in total, and 22% have no friends at all. Torn from their loved ones, many retreat into internet rabbit holes and unhealthy lifestyles. The COVID-19 pandemic intensified these feelings of isolation. A full 48% of millennials reported unwanted weight gain during the first year of the pandemic, with an average gain of 41 pounds. It was an average gain of 41 pounds. Jeez. That's crazy, dude. Uh, that's crazy. Yeah, that tracks. That that's tracks. a lot. No, that does. No, 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 no. Yeah. Hold on, though. It, that doesn't make sense to me. That's a lot of weight. It's, it's so, it's so wait a minute. So for millennials. I think I'm only surprised. Go ahead. For millennials, the average gain of 41 pounds. Like, so is that like millennials as a cohort? Like the average over like all of us? So like some gain none and others gain like like a hundred or whatever. Yeah. So it equal. That's that a lot of weight. That That's a lot that of weight, dude. That. I can't gain weight to save my life. I don't think that that's, I think I'm understanding this statistic differently. I think that it's like only 48% of millennials reported okay. the weight gain. Okay. And gotcha. of uh, those 48%, okay. the average gain was 41 pounds. I'm guessing. Gotcha. That's still huge. That I mean, that's still a, a, a lot. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 Uh, reading that sentence again, I'm like, here, you're right. That is, that is, yeah, that, that's still... Uh, <laughs> Distributed. That's still Dude, the I'm, average distribution. That's still over a lot. The number of people who report it. Like I, I notice like a a five pound fluctuation. Like like sometimes you know, like forty one pounds is a lot. Like you've got to be pretty desperate, um, to get there. Not trying to make anybody feel bad if anybody gained a lot of weight. I'm, it's okay. Yeah, I'm. That's, that's I also people, suck people at lots of things. Food and yeah. So. That fucking lockdown was really bad for people in a lot of ways. I think the only yeah. reason why it was shocking to me when I read that sentence was because I worked through the entire fucking yeah. pandemic. Like I was <laughs> moving things fucking furniture the whole time, so I was not. But like if you were sitting at home, like yeah, it's like I didn't have that experience. So I read that sentence and I was like, "What the fuck?" But then I'm like, "Okay, it kind of for real makes sense." Yeah. Uh, fifty kilometers a week uh, on my feet at the high school to a person who sat behind a desk like this mm. for eight hours. Mm -hmm. Um, so that had a, that had a, I'm one of those people who that had a tremendous impact on my body because then I also wasn't mm -hmm. like going out to punk shows or dancing at raves or anything like that, you know, and after a couple of months, my spouse and I actually had to be like, okay, well, we need to like create an exercise routine because life is different now. Yeah. That just shows right there. That shows the like uh, the fact that like so, for some of us that sentence is shocking. Is like uh, maybe that right there shows the PMC working class divide a little mm. bit. You know, that's a good point. Some of us are like, what the fuck, and then others are like, well, obviously. You know, <laughs> you know that the the PMC took to the lockdown like uh, like sucks to water. Mm. Um, all of a sudden, work yeah. was reduced to meet like. We didn't come come back from the offices. The capitalists forced us to come back from lockdown uh, against the wishes of maybe some in the state who were who either they were either benefiting from the lockdown or 
or they they thought it was a, a necessary sort of regulation to to prevent catastrophe. Uh, but like the owner class definitely wanted us to come back from the office and it wasn't out of motivation for the PMC. Because mm. the PMC was doing just fine doing nothing but having Zoom meetings. That was basically their, that's their dream existence. Mm. <laughs> yeah. I wonder though, I think one factor that seems to be under discussed is like, you know, because I think a lot of workers did want to stay remote, but, um, and there are various quality of life reasons for that. But one thing is like just the, um, for companies to be able to like, um, I don't know what the right word is, externalize, externality, like, yeah, like yeah, basically yeah. the cost, internet cost, cost of a desk and a chair and like heating and, and all of this stuff could be like, potentially permanently, you know, put on workers. Um, although it, it doesn't seem like, like a lot of companies have one and people back regardless. So maybe it's, it's not the way it's going, yeah. but that seemed to be kind of glossed over. Yeah, it's the, the, they wanted them back because of, I actually was writing a paper for this for TUCon that I, that I put on the back burner, but they wanted them back because of the ideology of the workforce. Yeah. The mechanical replication, ideological interpolation that happens to us in a workplace community, we we're not getting that. I thought because like again, everything would have been more profitable. It was like in the uh, there's that paper in the TU book, uh, Ted Reese's book. Mm -hmm. uh, like he demonstrates these guys have these these billionaire plutocrats. They have good accounting. They could do the math. They could see it was more profitable for them to keep to keep people out of the office. So there was a reason they chose to have to to have their media apparatuses say you need to come back to the office uh, to to you know put up billboards outside of around the Bay Area on the 580 like it's time to come back to work. You know, like that was done because of the value of workplace culture. Foucault, man, the bells. Yeah. That's fascinating. So it was, it was, but also different good. segments of, of cap, have, uh, different segments of capital have different interests. If you're a capitalist uh, in commercial real estate, you definitely have an interest in people coming back to the office. Mm, true, true. Uh, if you're someone who just, uh, whose work, who, uh, you know, uh, workforce, uh, can do just fine remotely, then it is in your interest uh, to have them work remotely. So, and it's funny thinking about how Donald Trump, he is a capitalist in commercial real estate. Um, so he represents, you know, a segment of capital that, you know, for example, would have an interest in people not working remotely. And perhaps that's why, you know, um, very indirectly, why maybe the PMC, uh, you know, is the party of, uh, the Democrats are the party of the PMC and Republicans are the party of productive capital, of commercial real estate, so on and so forth. It's a good point, man. Yeah, because it's- I have more to say, but I want to keep moving also. Oh, yeah, yeah. Cap capitalism is being served either way eventually, which is which is the nice thing for capitalism. Um. I, uh, uh, I, I think I finally have my audio and my video and OBS working. They're not the, the OBS camera, um, but I, I should probably bounce out in about 15 minutes. Do you folks want me to, to take over reading uh, around here? Yeah, that'd be cool. Yeah, awesome. Cool, cool, cool. Where, what, where are we at? I'll uh, squint really close at this, at this camera. Are you looking at the screen share? I am looking at the screen share, yeah. Highlighted where we're starting. Young pe young would be oh, professionals. Okay, okay. Young would be professionals are endlessly told that if they go to college, they'll have security and a real oh, choice. Sorry. You said you're squinting. Do you want me to zoom in? Like, would, would yeah, that help? Yeah, I wouldn't or? hate that. Okay, cool. I, yeah, I can't. I don't know what it looks oh, like. Perfect. For you. That's perfect. Is that yeah. better? Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They'll have uh, security and a real choice about what they do with their lives. The shocking reality for many is that they are acquiring debt for the right to earn a wage comparable to that of a 1970s factory worker without the quality pension 
or the job security that a 1970s factory worker would have enjoyed. The size of the debt limits their options and fills them with a desperation that makes them easy to exploit. Their principal fear is that all of this hard work will have been for nothing. They'll toil for years, accumulate large debts, and end up in jobs that are a little different from the jobs ordinary workers do. This, sadly, is the fate of many. We can make a distinction within the professional class. On the one hand, there are rump professionals who manage to get secure jobs in their majors and have the kind of life they envision for themselves where they make the si when they made the decision to go to college. On the other hand, there are fallen professionals who are forced into jobs that are precarious, low paying, or not in their preferred field. The fallen professionals are deprived of most of the benefits they were promised when they made the decision to go to college. All they have left for their university experience is their cultural capital, their familiar, this is talking about me now, uh, their familiarity with the symbols, norms, and language that educated people use. The more the fallen professionals are, are made to live like workers, the more they hold on to this cultural distinctiveness as a way of resisting proletarianization. This means the fallen professionals are constantly drawn into pretentious discourses that exclude ordinary workers. Again, me. Uh, the more a discourse excludes workers, the more that discourse flatters the fallen professional self-concept as a highly educated person of taste whose merit and virtue have gone unfairly unrewarded. Um, read the obscure text sentences. Can I keep going? Yeah, how many was that? Two was that two paragraphs or three? We're doing four. Okay. Well I'll do I'll do two more for you, good people. Thank you. The rump professionals, I mean, it's a little traumatic uh, reading about myself, but um, <laughs> the rump professionals did not experience the same letdown. They are doing the jobs they hoped they would do, and therefore they are much less resentful. Most of the prestigious, influential jobs in politics, the civil service, the media, and the arts are performed by rump professionals. Rump professionals make most of the content that other classes consume. They often work for oligarchs and corporations, but most of the people who consume the content they produce are workers and fallen professionals. To attract an audience, the rump professionals need to cater to the resentment that workers and fallen professionals feel. But if rump professionals direct resentment toward wealthy oligarchs, rump professionals will be directing resentment towards their own employers. This might get them fired. The rump professionals did not get to where they are by taking these kinds of risks. They were the honor students who followed the rules, the college students with the best networking skills. They have spent their whole lives trying to impress their parents, teachers, professors, and employers. They are the kiss asses. Um, in many cases, they have internalized the values of these authority figures, making it extremely difficult for them to even articulate a critique of those values in the first place. Even when they can articulate such a critique, their priority tends to be on keeping their jobs and moving up in their careers. Uh, how about I just take out these last two short paragraphs for us? Um, sure. Therefore, most rump professionals must direct resentment away from their bosses and onto various social and cultural groups. They encourage workers to blame social and cultural groups for social problems and they encourage fallen professionals to look down on workers for targeting 
uh, oh yeah, for targeting those groups. In this way, rump professionals encourage a cultural antagonism between workers and fallen professionals, making it harder for them to cooperate with one another against the oligarchs. Even when workers, professionals avoid swallowing these narratives, the rump professionals emotionally intense content monopolizes public discourse and crowds out alternatives. Anger and outrage are enormously viral online, and the market rewards media outlets and political organizations that find ways to generate it. The rump professionals are, for the most part, unaware of the role they play in perpetuating divisions and drowning out constructive attempts to organize. Many of them genuinely believe in the values of their employers. They are so effective at creating and disseminating content that defends their employer's interests in large part because they have bought into their employer's worldview. This brings us to our next class, the employers themselves. Jacob, since you're leaving pretty soon, you said, do you have anything to comment on that that you just read? Um, yeah, I was thinking, well, obviously, uh, when I know uh, a lot of folks, when they think of the, the, the PMC, they include uh, teachers in that. But, but uh, when I think of the educational field and I think of PMC, I think of the administrators. And I think there's a bit of solidarity because one, I'm not certificated late or a certificated staff member. I'm 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 unskilled labor. Um, but my union, the unskilled union made up mostly of people of color, and the teachers union um made up of skilled, you know, mostly I'd say fallen PMC. Uh, professional, mild professional types, diet professional types. Um, they, uh, we're, we're, we're sister unions, and so we organize and uh, work together. And the admin, the ma the the our managerial class, they're in a completely different union that does not negotiate or or collectively bargain with us. Um, so they. Uh, there's a there's an element of adversarialness there that I don't know that admin always gets because um, they uh, they think of themselves. It says here, you know, that they they share they're not aware of their role in this divisiveness um, and they share the value of the employer class. But I think they they think they're sharing the value, our value. Uh, of the of the the fallen uh and the fallen professional and the the workers um they think they're on our side and that they're working alongside us and i don't know that they've fully recognized that their role in the machine uh as managers is to uh manage to curb and manage our uh, uh our enthusiasm let's say, as, as their worker pool. What's interesting about this is the, the complexity of the dynamic here that uh, is, I feel like, who is recognized culturally as being like what we would call PMC isn't necessarily going to be like in the broader culture. That might be one type of person, like a fallen professional, but like within the organization themselves, they're the fallen professional who is culturally recognized as a PMC is going to recognize themselves as a worker. You know what I mean? Yes. There's like a, and, there's and, like kind of a complication. Really these... Because within the PMC, it's going to manufacture a little micro PMC to do the PMC yeah. managing over the rest of the PMC. Yeah. Totally. Totally. It's, uh, it's crazy how that, uh, yeah, it's just it's an interesting complex dynamic there. All right, folks, this was a lot of fun. Uh, I'm gonna jump off, and I'm actually gonna try to experiment with letting OBS record you folks. So, how long roughly do you do you think you're planning to go? 
I'm gonna go. I'm only till two o'clock because uh, I've got to give my right. computer your back. Perfect. So all right, I'm 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 going to ask Kate uh, uh, away from keyboard, but it's gonna be recording you folks the whole time. So don't do anything okay. too weird. <laughs> All right, who is next? The employers. Uh, I'll go, because I was uh, away for a bit. And some people came to my apartment. Sorry, but, so I've missed a bit. But um, for our purposes, the employers are the people who are their own boss, regardless of education level. Like the professionals, they come in two varieties. The small employers run small businesses while the oligarchs own large stakes in the transnational corporations that increasingly dominate the landscape. The oligarchs are the primary beneficiaries of the economic changes we've been describing. Between 1971 and 2021, the top 1% of American earners saw their share of national income increase from 11.1 to 19.1%. Their share of national wealth, including the share of physical assets like land, as well as their share of investment capital, increased from 26.3% in 1971 to 34.9% in 2021. The top 1% of U.S. households now own 15 times more wealth than the bottom 50%. During the COVID-19 pandemic, the net worth of American billionaires grew by 50%. Small employers are often encouraged to think of themselves as riding the same wave, but their situation is different. The median small business has less than one month's worth of expenses on hand. Because of this, even aggressive stimulus programs failed to save some of them from the pandemic. Almost 2% of small businesses closed permanently by April of 2020. Oligarchs can move their money all over the world using capital mobility to get the best deals from governments. But small businesses are much less mobile. Your local restaurant cannot make hamburgers overseas or sell those hamburgers to customers across the ocean. Small businesses are dependent on local economic conditions in the places where they are geographically situated. When the wages of American workers stagnate, oligarchs can market their products to the emerging middle classes in countries like China, Brazil, or India. Small employers are tied to America's fate, and when American workers can't spend money, they struggle. As wage growth stagnates, the business models of many small employers become more and more dependent on ordinary Americans accumulating debt or receiving checks from the federal government. The small businesses that survived the pandemic did so with an enormous amount of federal aid. The Paycheck Protection Program, which loaned business money to cover their labor expenses during the pandemic, cost $800 billion. Most workers and professionals who try and become employers fail. Only half of new businesses survive for five years. Push it to 10 years and the survival rate drops to just one third. Most of a bit. Have you ever seen like the, the rates of um, like uh, restaurant or kitchen nightmares and like every single one of those restaurants fails after the show leaves within a couple months but <laughs> push it to <laughs> 10 years and the survival rates drop to just one third most of the businesses that make it stay small 89 percent of all u.s firms employ fewer than 20 people and less than one percent employ more than 500. this means that most employers are in a precarious position they aren't large enough to enjoy the benefits of capital mobility and therefore, they are constantly worried about the future of the country. If the living standards of ordinary Americans stagnate or decline, this very directly undermines the ability of small employers to survive. However, because small employers are themselves employers, they also worry that wages will, wage increases will hurt their bottom lines. This puts them in a contradictory position. They need American workers to prosper so that they can continue to sell goods and services to people living in their local communities, but their own precarity leaves them in a weak position to supply those workers with wage increases. Who's um, next? Well, I can keep going, I guess. But the all I can go. Okay, yeah, go for it. <laughs> Okay. The oligarchs leverage this tension, pitting small employers against wage earners and therefore against their own customers. Through the media they own, the oligarchs argue that any policy that might restrict the oligarchs' growth will cause small businesses to fail. They argue against increases in the minimum wage and increases in tax rates, claiming 
that while they might be able to shoulder these burdens, the small businesses will buckle. The thing is, the very reason that small businesses are so vulnerable in the first instance is the weakness of American local economies. It is because oligarchs push down wages and push down tax rates that small businesses have a customer base that is so vulnerable and in, so inconsistent. This way, the oligarchs perpetuate a vicious cycle in which the increased vulnerability of American small businesses is used to get those businesses to support some policies that make them even more vulnerable. Desperate to survive, small businesses often resort to wage theft. An estimated $15 billion to $50 billion is stolen from American workers here. Often employers fail to pay overtime, force employees to work off the clock, misclassify their workers as independent contractors, pay them with checks that bounce, confiscate their tips, and even even illegally deduct their own expenses from workers' wages. Nearly four in 10 American workers report having lost wages in these ways. Most never come forward for fear of retaliation, and this makes it difficult for us to know the true extent of these losses. Apart from the oligarchs, no one is safe from the consequence of the competitive global economy. The workers straightforwardly experience stagnating living standards. The professionals compete with each other for a scarce number of lucrative roles in which they are often paid to produce propaganda for the oligarchs and corporations to employ them and fund their work. The small employers need American workers and professionals to provide them with a strong, stable customer base and as that base erodes, they are too, they too are increasingly fragile. All of these classes are full of anxiety and worry. I don't know if we want to stop there for any commentary or just continue reading or. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I did think anyone... it's. Oh, go ahead. I, I did think it's uh, um, just interesting talking about working for small businesses and how uh, it often is a far more onerous experience than working for a large corporation. Um, yep. You, yeah, I mean, you really are just at the whim of someone that unfortunately you often have to work alongside of uh, every day as opposed to kind of, uh, in a way, the more preferable alienation uh, where you're um that you just don't have in a small business um and you know there aren't like procedures for you know taking time off or uh requesting sick time that you have at least with working for a large corporation and i think this is why dave often talks about the benefits of working for amazon versus i don't know working at a, a small business um so those are just some of my thoughts. I found it to be like, uh, in some ways, more flexible to work for a small business is in some ways less. Um, it, I guess it depends on what you're looking for. Because like right now, I can just tell my boss it's kind of a small company. I can just be like, hey, I need this day off. And there's no like paperwork I have to fill out. It's just like, I get it. It just, if I need a day off, I need a day off. It doesn't matter. But then again, I also don't get great benefits, so because he can't, he probably just can't afford it. I mean, so yeah, genuinely, probably just doesn't have the money to pay for like a really nice benefits package for his entire company. So it's complicated. Um, I think it's me. Is it me at this point, or is it someone else? I forget who what the order was. Yeah, it's you, bud. Okay, I thought so. Okay. Uh, I'll just pick up right here. To make matters worse, the changes to our economic system are extremely difficult to reverse. There are some very serious obstacles to change that are too often left out of the story. Let's turn to them now. And I'll just keep going here. I'll do four from here. Uh, the trouble with reforms. 
The competitive global economy has strengthened the power of oligarchs. The economic historian Walter Scheidel observes that once extraordinary inequalities of wealth and power take hold in a society, they are only very rarely disrupted. Historically, peaceful reform hasn't just managed to get the job done. Scheidel identifies four forces that have a sh that have shown a real capacity to substantially weaken or displace entrenched oligarchs. War, revolution, collapse, state collapse, and pandemics. But crucially, this doesn't mean that just any war or any pandemic will knock the oligarchs off their perch. The Iraq war came alongside continuous growth in the wealth and power of American oligarchs, and the COVID-19 pandemic increased the wealth and power of oligarchs more than any other event of the, past, of the last 30 years. Throughout the Iraq war and the COVID-19 pandemic, global supply chains continued to operate and capital remained mobile. These events not only failed to disrupt the accumulation of wealth by oligarchs, they accelerated it. In the face of events like these, the oligarchs are anti-fragile. They turn mild and moderate disorder to their advantage. Interesting. When Scheidel says that wars and pandemics can produce leveling, he isn't talking about the kinds of wars and pandemics that we've been having recently. He's talking about enormously horrific events like world wars and the Black Death. These events produced leveling because they were truly existential. The world wars made it unsafe to move money and goods across the oceans. They made it unsafe to live and work abroad. The threat of losing the war enabled governments to impose large tax rates on oligarchs. The devastation the war visited upon Europe destroyed a lot of the oligarchs' wealth. Between 1941 and 1945, American top 1% income share dropped for from 21.6 to 14.3 percent. In countries where the, top, where the fighting was the thickest, the drop was even more pronounced. The French, t French top 1 percent income share fell from 16.8 percent in 1940 to 8.5 percent in 1945. In the first few decades following the war, oligarchs were unable to recover the large shares they previously enjoyed. American top 1% income share bottomed out at 10.2% in 1976, while France's share bottomed out at 6.6% .6 in 1984. But today their income share is up to 19.1%. Here, well in France, 19.1% here, while in France it's up to 10%. The wars diminished the wealth and power of the oligarchs, but not permanently. From the very beginning of the post-war era, oligarchs sought to increase capital mobility by gradually lowering trade barriers. The first trade concessions came as early as 1947, when the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, GATT, came into, a fo into force. Further tariff concessions came in 1949, 1950, 1956, 1960, 1964, and 1973, culminating in the creation of the World Trade Organization in 1986. Top 1% income share continued to fall during much of this period, but as global trade opened up, the ability of the oligarchs to politically reassert themselves increased. The more the American worker had to compete with the workers of countries like J Germany, Japan, and China, the less leverage they had to, in labor negotiations with oligarchs. I think I have one more. Um, in the 1970s, at the peak of America's labor unions, oligarchs mobilized heavily to tilt the balance back in their direction. The Chamber of Commerce tripled its budget and doubled its membership between 1974 and 1980. Corporate political action groups quintupled their expense expenditure between the late 1970s and the late 1980s, diminishing the relative influence of, of the unions. The oligarchs founded new think tanks like the Heritage Foundation and increased the budget of the of the American Enterprise Institute tenfold. The number of firms with registered lobbyists in Washington increased from 175 in 1971 to 2,500 in 1982. All the work that had been done to reduce the wealth and power of the oligarchs during the post-war era proved totally unable to withstand the onslaught. The vaunted unions were no match. While union membership did increase during the post-war era, the growth in capital mobility fatally undercut their leverage. When the oligarchs politically mobilized, creeping capital mobility put the wind at their back. The more the oligarchs pushed politically, the more the obstacles to cap capital, capital mobility crumbled, the more, and the more 
mobile capital became, the more effective the pushing became. It was a losing game for labor, and the game is still being played to this day. This is why um, when I said to like, I was in a room full of, I was at a DSA meeting, and mm -hmm. I said, um, I said something about there being a class war on, and like, we need to wake up because there's like a class war, like, and, and it was like, when I said it, I, maybe that was the way I said it, but people thought I was joking in a DSA meeting. They thought I was like wow. exaggerating. It, it was bizarre. It was very strange. It was like, I don't know. I mean it. Like, wh why do you people think I'm exaggerating? You know, and maybe it was something about the way I said it or the context I said it, but it was like a general, I got a lot of vibes of just being like, are we really here to change the world? I don't mm. think we are really here to that made it it was it took me probably like a month to notice that like no really we're not here to change the world we're not really taking this seriously so why am i wasting my time here in this room you know mm -hmm. yeah that's wild if you if you would think any audience would be amenable you would think it might be the dsa people but you think yeah um I'll keep us going here. Um, this hasn't stopped theorists from trying to imagine ways of reversing the trend. Thomas Piketty argues that if we could get movements, sorry, get governments to club together and agree on common economic policies, the oligarchs would lose their ability to pit countries and states against each other. He calls for a global wealth tax. The trouble is that global political coordination requires that many countries elect all at the same time politicians who are interested in pursuing this strategy. If some countries don't have governments that are interested, those countries can take advantage. Offering oligarchs and corporations special deals to relocate jobs and investment. In each country, oligarchs are heavily politically mobilized, preventing the election of governments that might be interested in Piketty's strategy. It is difficult to get this kind of government elected even in a single country let alone in enough countries to enable global or even regional wealth taxes. Consider the obstacles, obstacles this strategy faces in just the United States alone. Because the United States has a federal system with three distinct branches of government, delivering political change requires a movement to win an enormous number of elections. It's not enough to win the presidency. The president needs the cooperation of both the House and the Senate. It's quite expensive to run even just one competitive federal campaign, let alone a large number of them. And many competitive campaigns still result in defeat. The president also needs state governments to cooperate or for the Supreme Court to protect the president's agenda from their non-cooperation. If the president were to sign a treaty on a global wealth tax, that treaty would need to be ratified by the Senate. If the global wealth tax were framed as a mere agreement to circumvent the Senate's right to scrutinize treaties, Congress could refuse to legislate in accordance with the agreement. The election of a new president more amenable to oligarchic interests could easily scupper any agreement that is not formalized as a treaty. Other countries know this, and even a well-meaning president would have a difficult time convincing them that we would be able to keep our word. So while Piketty's wealth tax would theoretically solve the problem, it lacks political feasibility. Piketty argues that if this kind of coordination proves impossible, governments might undermine capital mobility by returning to protectionist policies and imposing capital controls, limiting the ability of oligarchs to rapidly move money from place to place. But any presidential candidate, candidate who choreographs an interest in such policies could see an enormous amount of jobs and investment flee to tax havens and, quote, emerging markets, unquote, between their election and their inauguration. To impose capital controls without risking capital flight, the president would have to spring them on the oligarchs as a surprise without campaigning for them or establishing any democratic mandate for them. If the president imposed strict protectionist measures all at once, the protectionist policies would greatly disrupt supply chains, leading to inflation and recession. The president would be unlikely to politically survive, and the president's successor would probably reverse the measures. If the president imposed the protectionist measures gradually, 
oligarchs would have a chance to respond to the initial measures. They could push Congress to override the measures with legislation, or they could move money abroad before the measures kick in. If the president doesn't openly campaign on protectionism, the president is unlikely to have allies, many allies in Congress who will support doing it. While some theorists offer policies that would work, but would be enormously difficult to implement, others offer policies that are easy to implement, but will make little difference. Very often in American politics, it is suggested that we might raise taxes on the rich by a bit. Modest tax hikes on the wealthy are plausible, but they just aren't up to the challenge. To reduce top 1% income share to the level it was at in the 1970s, it's estimated that we would need to raise the effective tax rate on the top 1% to 67.5%. Keep in mind, we're talking about the effective rate here, not the marginal rate. The top 1% would need to pay 67.7%, including any deductions and tax breaks that they might receive. The top marginal tax rate is currently just 37%. A tax hike of that kind would result in capital flight and extensive political mobilization by the oligarchs. Smaller, more feasible tax hikes have no chance of restoring the income distribution that prevailed in the post-war era. They are tokenistic measures, and even they are often opposed vigorously by the oligarchs. Many oligarchs hope to tax, to drive tax rates on the top 1% down even lower. Most efforts to raise top rates of tax are efforts to reverse new cuts rather than efforts to restore, even partially, the higher rates that prevailed in the 1970s and earlier. I'll finish with this last paragraph. Elements of the left, the right, and the center have tried to work around these constraints. At least they've tried to persuade us that they're trying. <laughs> we'll discuss their efforts in greater detail in chapter two. But for now, it is important to take serious stock of the array of obstacles that stand in the way of reform. Global wealth taxes and robust protectionist measures require a stable governing majority, the likes of which has not been seen in the United States for decades. Without such a majority, we simply don't have the credibility to push other countries to agree to major reforms of the global tax and trade system. Even if such a majority comes into existence in the United States, it will face stiff resistance from oligarchs and corporations. As Wolfgang Street hauntingly puts it, unsatisfied demands of capital make themselves felt as disturbances to, quote, the economy, unquote. Elected governments seldom survive such disturbances. Um, 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 um. Spooky. Spooky. We're <laughs> fucked. There's nothing we can do. <laughs> Hell yeah. Well, that <laughs> that's is, what section that's what is like. Sorry, you go, you go. No, no, no. Uh, that's all I was gonna say. Is that's right where we need to be. That we're fucked. I feel. I. I'm. I'm pro despair right now. Yeah, man. Yeah. That's where I'm at. Yeah, yeah. I was just gonna say that section is like interesting in light of like the uh election that just happened and i think i think i think benjamin has talked about this like on some recent appearances on like the sublation podcast or maybe it was the why left episode or something like but uh i because uh i mean the trump campaign was is ostensibly is going to be implementing protectionist tariffs uh, but and they do seem to but like yeah yeah exactly <laughs> So I guess it's like we'll see, we'll see. That's just the most I can say. We can say about that right now. I don't. Mm -hmm. But it, but it's really it's just like I, I, that part stood out. I'm like, oh okay. I want to. This book is like alive. So I want to see how mm -hmm. that plays out and think about it in the next as you know political events keep going on. Anyways. <laughs> Yeah, there's I think we yeah. might be able to knock out the rest of the chapter if we plow through. I think there's about five and a half pages left. Fuck yeah, let's, let's do, do it. it. Uh yeah. I have to leave a round two, but I might be able to fudge it a little bit if we need to. But yeah, let's try and uh if if we want to have a conversation after that. But yeah, let's 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 do it. Let's do it. The trouble with revolution. Scheidel does list 
revolution among his four sources of leveling. But there are lots of reasons to think revolution is unlikely. For one, as Scheidel points out, the revolutions of the 20th century occurred largely as a consequence of the world wars themselves. World War I precipitated the Russian Revolution. World War II brought the Maoists to power in China. Revolutions in other, smaller countries occurred in large part because the world wars exhausted the strength of the European imperial states, leading to power vacuums in their colonial empires. But beyond this, there is also a lack of credible alternatives to democracy. When revolutions happened in the 20th century, they happened at a time when Soviet-style communism had not yet been tried, or at the very least had not yet collapsed. The fall of the Soviet Union discredited not just its own model, but led people to question the very possibility of there being any credible alternative to our own system. In the wake of the Soviet collapse, theorists like Francis Fukuyama argued that the world was on the brink of an end of history, in which it became increasingly unthinkable to imagine liberal democracy giving way to anything else. More recently, David Runciman has argued that liberal democracies are in what he calls a confidence trap, having successfully weathered many crises and defeated both the communist and fascist alternatives, older, more established democracies like the United States have become overconfident in their ability to solve problems. They let chronic problems fester, assuming democratic institutions will find a way to muddle through when problems come to a head. Then there's the extensive toolkit that American democracy uses to, in Streak's words, buy time. Whenever America's back is up against a wall, it passes a stimulus bill or incentivizes the private sector to allow Americans to borrow more money. If there isn't enough tax revenue or private credit available to fund emergency measures, the Federal Reserve rides to the rescue on the back of a wave of quantitative easing. The COVID-19 pandemic illustrated just how little government needs to offer its citizens to keep them from getting ideas. Donald Trump sent Americans two checks, one valued at $1,200 and the other at $600. Joe Biden promised $2,000 checks and sent $1,400. Trump sent $600 in supplementary unemployment benefit, then cut that figure to $300 before Joe Biden eliminated it outright in September of 2021. Much of the rest of the stimulus money went into Paycheck Protection Program, in which the federal government subsidized employers instead of sending money directly to working families. These paltry checks were enough to get Americans to tolerate one of the worst recessions in history. There are theorists that like to compare the United States to other countries where democratic institutions have unraveled or suggest that American institutions are sliding in an authoritarian direction. I'll discuss these arguments in detail in Chapter 3. For now, I want to emphasize that for all the noise about Donald Trump having authoritarian intentions... He was defeated at the ballot box, but little does Benjamin <laughs> of the past know that he did not <laughs> remain defeated. His attempts to stick around in defiance of the results received little support from America's political institutions. Congress verified the election result with the help of Vice President Pence. The Supreme Court, including the justices Trump himself appointed, rejected Trump's legal challenges. State governments did not cave to pressure from the president to alter the results, even in states where most of the officials were members of the president's own party. The military showed no willingness to help the president stay on. Many generals and officers openly loathed the president from the start, and he did not poll particularly well with active duty troops. Not according to, I mean... From what I hear, he was very popular among the Marines, from my Marine friend. Well, well so maybe that, uh, there's that's different. Uh, than, uh, there's stratification. The yeah, there's there's uh, yeah. like the Chair For Force, sure. the or the Air Force is like fucking super duper PMC, and then the Marine. And this is off the point, anyway. But yeah, for sure. <laughs> uh. 
Uh, who is next? Uh, Jord yeah. Jordan. No, Jordan. Uh, oh, there he is. It was. Uh, it was politically where I was politically useful to the Democratic Party to suggest that American democracy was existentially threatened precisely because of the degree to which so many Americans remain committed to democracy as a political system. While the polls do indicate that more Americans are dissatisfied with our democratic system, dissatisfaction was this, with the system has no relationship to support for authoritarianism. And a full 78% say that democracy is preferable to any other kind of government. Why couldn't Trump break American institutions? Democratic theorists argue that established democracies have inclusive or impersonal institutions based on a rule of law that prevent any particular section of the elite from putting down political roots. American democracy is dominated by the oligarchs, but these elites are forced to compete with each other for preeminence through a set of institutions that are by design, extremely difficult for any one section of the elite to dominate. Jeffrey Winters calls America a civil oligarchy. Oligarchs cannot rule directly as princes or aristocrats, but have to project power through a mediating set of impersonal political institutions. These institutions push them into conflict with each other. It is made to counteract ambition. If Donald Trump establishes himself as an autocrat, this is to the disadvantage of other elites who hope to one day win the powers of the presidency for themselves. Some Republican elites feel the need to be seen to support the president to get the votes of his supporters. But their willingness to support the president is predicated on the possibility that they can use the president's supporters to further their own ambitions. If Trump becomes an autocrat, these elites would lose the opportunity to fulfill those ambitions. The incentive to support Trump therefore only lasts as long as the elections continue to matter. The labyrinthine federal system frustrates both reformers and would-be authoritarians, and it often blurs the distinction between the two. When Franklin Roosevelt's agenda was blocked by the Supreme Court, he tried to pack it with new justices. Some theorists characterize the court packing plan as an assault on democracy and argue that its failure demonstrates American democratic resilience. This is because these American democratic theorists largely buy the argument that the Supreme Court is a democratic institution. Britain, the House of Lords, responded by simply reducing the power of the Lords to block legislation. Oh, I missed. Uh, in Britain, the House of Lords tried to frustrate government policy in 1911 and 1949. The government responded by simply reducing the power of the Lords to block legislation. Most Demo British democratic theorists don't consider the Lords reforms anti-democratic. For them, the Lords were an undemocratic institution that frustrated the will of the people. Whether a procedural reform purifies or distorts democracy depends greatly on your point of view. Roosevelt had, had succeeded in packing the court. The defenders of judicial review might, ex, might have succeeded in packing the court. The defenders of judicial review might feel very differently about the court today. It might look to them the way the House of Lords looks to the British, uh, but it didn't happen. Instead, when Roosevelt tried to pass his economic reforms, they were blocked by the court. When he tried to pack the court, he was blocked by members of his own party in Congress. Everywhere Roosevelt looked, there were more obstacles. Fukuyama calls this aspect of American democracy vetoocracy. Our political institutions are defined more by what they can block by them by what they can accomplish. Even presidents associated with enormous legislative and electoral successes are frequently stimmied. Want to keep going? Okay. Uh, as long as Americans see no credible alternative to democracy and American democracy continues to heavily feature an extensive set of checks and balances, 
there was little chance of replacing the American political system with some other system. And to be sure, this doesn't preclude the possibility of American democratic procedures being gently reformed by changing the Supreme Court, creating new states, overhauling campaign finance, opening up voter access laws, and so on. But if oligarchs can block ordinary reforms that might threaten their wealth and power, they can just Oops. Yeah. as easily block procedural reforms that might do the same things. We are therefore much more likely to get superficial procedural reforms aimed at purifying in our democracy than in practice make little difference to policy outcomes. These reforms would be about shoring up our belief in the fairness of the system rather than about changing the kinds of decisions it makes. They certainly would not stop oligarchs in corporations from continuing to accumulate wealth and power at the expense of ordinary people. Go or was it uh who was next? Spencer. Spencer, I think. Yeah, um from the top, let's see. Yeah. These, ob these obstacles lead Scheidel to conclude that it is impossible to rein in the powers of oligarchs. Reforms and revolutions won't work, and wars and plagues would cost us too much. He suggests we had better get used to this new world we're living in. If history is anything to go by, peaceful policy reform may well prove unequal to the growing challenges ahead. But what of the alternatives? All of us who prize ec greater economic equality would do well to remember that with the rarest of exceptions, it was only ever brought forth in sorrow. Be careful for what you wish for. Scheidel goes so far as to suggest that high economic inequality is a default condition of human civilization. But while the middle part of the 20th century may look like a blip to economic historians, many Americans today still remember a time when economic growth and technological change served many of our people, rather than just the wealthy few. In the 20th century, we became accustomed to a world where wages and living standards increased rapidly, a world where people could expect their children and grandchildren to live more stable and more prosperous lives. A person born in the 1920s saw enormous improvements in working conditions and living standards by the time they saw early middle age. Even a person born in the 1960s saw a marked increase with, enorm with enormous technological change by the early 2000s. Young people born in the 1990s and 2000s grew up with parents and grandparents who believed in this world and what it could be. These people will not so easily accept the notion that the 50 years of falling inequality between 1930 and 1980 were weird, that the distribution of wealth and power that prevailed in the 19th century and earlier was normal. Great. It's not as if things are standing still, either. The mobility of capital continues to increase, automation and technological development continue to weaken labor's negotiating position, and the gap between the oligarchs and the rest of us continues to grow larger and larger. How can we get used to a world that is becoming more vicious and more disappointing at such an alarming pace? Every new crisis sees a handful of billionaires grab ever more wealth from the rest of us. Workers, fallen professionals, and small employers all steal all feel stuck in a system that doesn't seem to care about them or how hard they work. They know it wasn't always this way, and they feel enormous resentment. This resentment is too powerful to be ignored. Too many young people can w too many people can win too many votes by feeding it. Too many people can make too much money by pandering to it. Over and over, politicians promise hope and change, or that the forgotten masses will not be forgotten anymore. Over and over, media outlets point the finger at different groups in our society, turning resentment into blame and hatred. They promise us miracle cures, offering us easy solutions to complex problems. Every time they promise to help, every time they tell us that some group is the only thing standing in our way, they raise our hopes and expectations. The people who tell us the problems cannot be solved, that there is nothing to be done but play by the oligarchs' rules. These people are quitters, and they don't win elections or get clicks. They aren't competitive, and we're slowly going extinct. Hmm. Instead of politicians... Uh, Sorry. There it is. Yeah. Instead of politicians and media personalities who tell us our system is fine, 
we will increasingly have leaders who tell us they know how to save it. Our elites know we don't really believe in our system anymore, but we also don't believe in any alternative to it. That means we have to believe there is a way to purify it, a way to make it deliver for us. It's the only way we can tolerate living in a disappointing system that we cannot escape. We are desperate to believe in an easy way out, and the elites who want our votes and our cliques will offer us a never-ending parade of false solutions. These solutions have to feel real, and that means they have to be credibly branded as radical, as rebellious, as forms of resistance. But because none of them can actually deal with our competitive global economy, none of them can deliver any real change. Each solution ends in disenchantment, and that means that the next solution has to modify the branding to offer a different aesthetic package for the same old status quo. In the next chapter, we'll talk about some of the solutions that are being marketed to us by elites operating in different parts of the political spectrum. While some of these elites position themselves as part of the left or right, their solutions will lead us back to the same place, back to a country where life gradually grows more brutal and ordinary people gradually grow more frustrated. Uh, That's the chapter. Hell yeah. Great job, everybody. We made it. I'm just going back over some of that a little bit. Well, don't worry, everyone. The next chapter is called False Hope. So. <laughs> <laughs> I love this. That means we have to believe. Uh, oh, this one. No, these solutions have to feel real, and that means they have to be branded as radical and rebellious as forms of resistance. Fuck. <clears throat> ah, that's. Yeah. Yeah, they have to. They have to. Otherwise, we won't do anything. Because. I, I love that. like the. <sighs> I mean, you can buy the the revolution. It's not televised, right? It's a fucking it's a t shirt that you can buy in someone's TikTok yeah. shop. Um, <laughs> it's televised it already. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but no, like I, uh, uh, I don't know. I think the that's revolution gonna... is not televised. Is televised. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. They they uh they right um, <laughs> who is they? What is they? Whatever. But like the the political operators or whatever are very much aware of our like collective nihilism like we're over it and so they they do like these things that are like shocking to to get through and and convince people like they pick out like very real issues that are that are real and that they can point to and be like look at this this is a radical thing that we can do we can solve this hyper specific issue for these people that are hurting and in in need um, and because we don't believe in broad change anymore in general, um, very caring, well-meaning people get carried away in the momentum of these identity specific movements. Um, and then we all just like it, it, it yeah, it's sad. Yeah. That's a, that's, that's a, I think it's key to remember that like none of we don't like nobody intend like and nobody intends to be stupid you know like <laughs> like nobody's no, nobody's it's nobody's nobody's maliciously like playing into this it's like everyone i mean all, most of us in general mm -hmm. most people i think have good intentions and are trying you know or, tr or at least trying to try mm -hmm. you know but that there is there, there is no way out like no 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 one has created any anyway no one has facilitated a, a, a way out you know no one's dug dug a little hole so we can see a bit of light through it we're still in complete darkness you mm. know so until someone breaks through and like lets a bit little bit of light through we have no direction you know yeah all i dark. feel like that all that quote uh, that you pointed out and then something from the walter ben michaels interview uh with theory underground can you still hear me yeah yep okay sorry i got a weird notification um 
just yeah I think it gives like provides more context for like the like m increasingly absurd like identitarian games that people are playing because I think that like yeah d deciding that people are doing it because they're selfish or they're narcissistic or whatever like is a, a lazy and like incurious way to understand people's motivations mm -hmm. um and of course we can all be selfish blah 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 but it's it's not that interesting um and mm -hmm. i think that like there are like deeper more substantial reasons why and incentives for this like type of like virtue signaling and identity posturing that we're seeing and it's a lot more like useful to try and like get at the root and the context that's producing it rather than yeah being like oh yeah they're snowflakes or yeah they're stupid or whatever i, I can't resist a comment on that because i i wholly agree with you um and but also that is the point to me of like the idea of the culture of narcissism it's like you said, we're not narcissists. And it's like in the colloquial way way we use that term. Yeah, you're right. You're totally right. Because it's used interchangeably with like selfishness. But like in the sense of like the Lashian sense of narcissism. Mm -hmm. Like the point <laughs> is that we're all narcissists. The totally. point is that we're all You know what I mean? Totally. No, I'm, I'm looking forward to reading that Lash book. Because yes, I think that you're totally right. Like the colloquial way it gets used is greatly distinct from uh, the way that Lash employs it, for sure. He he wrote a whole nother book after the after the culture of narcissism, being like, "You guys still don't get it." <laughs> like, I wrote a whole book on it, and you still don't get it. Um, and I'd be <laughs> I'd love to talk to you, Kira, at some point more about um. You mentioned uh, what's her name, Christopher Lash's daughter. Uh, you mentioned her in your your talk at TUCon. So I'd love to, I haven't read any of her work, so I'd love to like pick your brain at some point about like what you got out of more about what you got out of reading her too. But yeah, it sounds good. I'm going to try and reread most of it this week. So it'll be fresh on my mind soon. Oh, hell yeah. Well, on that Anyone note. else have any uh, closing thoughts? Oh, sure. oh, I uh, I just had a quick comment about this paragraph where um, I was thinking about it in terms of uh, politicians who offer solutions. Um, I feel like Trump actually um, is is the politician who offers simple solutions uh, to intractable problems. I mean, that's what the, the tariffs are. The idea that somehow if we establish the tariffs, we're going to be able to bring back, uh, you know, manufacturing like we had, um, for neoliberalism. And I think to some extent, the Democrats know that that's not going to work. I think to some extent they know the way is shut and that's why they have to pretend like everything is fine. Right. And the Republicans, I think Donald Trump, um, I don't know. I think perhaps they they think that something can be done to bring us back before neoliberalism. Um, there almost is a, a more hopefulness, perhaps even an optimism there. And yeah, I think Democrats know just like yeah, it, there are no solutions. That's why we have, we have to pretend like everything is great. So that's just that was just like what I a. Like rather than thinking of like revolutionary leftist solutions, I was thinking more of like what you know the Trumpian solution is. And yeah, I don't know. Hmm. I do wonder. I do wonder how many people believe in this solution, or how many people really are just kind of gleefully dancing off into the fucking raging bonfire that is the future. Like I, I. I think there are a lot of people who are like excited at the notion of tariffs um, and they're like, well, yeah, let me explain it to you. But I think there are more people who like we're all just kind of feeling this fucking pull toward the end of the fucking world. I don't think anybody I don't think Trump voters believe Trump is the answer. I think Trump voters believe he's it's a salve. It's going to assuage this fucking nihilism and like boredom and despair that we all feel. Um 
but I think it's some of both. Yeah, it. You're like, right. It is definitely. Yeah. Like when I've like my younger brother is like a big Trump guy recently, and but he's not. I don't think he's a typical like when you when people think of like he's more of like the kind of like online crypto if i'm gonna try to stereotype him which is like reductive obviously but you know but it's like that's not what i think i think this is like a weird subsection of the right now but it's kind of like the mere the, the, the equivalent of like an, a leftist where it's like mm. yeah it's this kind of gleeful like libidinal thing and they enjoy the online participation community mm. aspect yeah and and but i don't but i don't think this is like what the majority of people are do are getting off on doing mm. the and so like he'll talk about tariffs and like fall is like policies stuff like that but i don't know i don't know how much he really understands any of it anyways and and i but i just i don't i don't know if this is what i don't think most people are really that tuned in or like get i don't know but i think i think there's definitely a lot of both and mm. and even in like within the same person it's both a lot of the time that's key well if, if yeah. anyone yeah oh go ahead gear i feel like a lot i don't know i kind of feel like a lot of people like are unaware that they have some sort of like erotic attraction to like millennialism and messianic mm. stuff like because yeah i think you totally see it in this like idea from some christians in the u.s that the like society is falling and getting more and decaying more and more and blah 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 and then that this strong man is is going to like save us from that but i absolutely like i just i think most anarchists are like sexually attracted to the apocalypse you know and they'll talk about it like it like this like the words they're saying contradict like the glint in their eyes and like the excitement like there's a yeah. jouissance for sure where it's like you're talking about like mass death and <laughs> the collapse of healthcare and education in the state and like you just want that so badly and you'll never admit it you know mm-hmm horny for the apocalypse yeah. mm. And I, I think, and uh, I, yeah, I think there's a milder version that many people in between um, are feeling as well. Sorry, <laughs> I'll stop there. Yeah. I, I agree with a lot of this. I think it was more true of the first time Trump in the second election that Trump ran. But like, I feel like this time, like, I really do think that it's inflation. And I think people are mm. being practical in a way and pragmatic. And they, they don't think that Trump... I don't think most people who voted for Trump think that Trump is going to really like turn America back to prior to neoliberalism. I think that that was true the the first and second time around. The third time around, I think that it's just really like we just need to like fucking get the economic boot off our neck. We just need to get some breathing room, you know. We just need to get our heads above water and go back to like what it was a couple of years ago, you know. And so like uh, I think there's definitely an element to all of the like messianic stuff for sure. But I think like I think a lot of people voted for Trump just because they're like they're trying to be pragmatic. They're trying to be practical, you know, and like it, it doesn't really make total sense if you think about it, because like Trump isn't he isn't doing anything differently with the Fed. He's legally not allowed to change who's in charge of the Fed and he's not trying to. And so he's just, and he's actually in favor of what the Fed has been doing. And so he's like, what is he really changing to help inflation? You know what I mean? Like, he's not really changing anything. So, it, but it seemed like, it seemed like the general logic was just like, of our general national logic for this election was like, fuck it, the shit isn't working. Let's do something else. It seems like it sums up why, to me, to me, why Trump won, you know, fuck it. I, this isn't fucking working. Let's do something different. Mm. You know, I don't know. Do you want to buy that or what? Yeah, I mean, I definitely think that might be. I I think there's like different there's different coalitions of people, obviously, and and we, even within again individuals or people have different motivating th things that take over at different points, and and so I I feel like. The kind of a way, um, a big part of this book and what we've got in some introduction to with what um, Benjamin's doing to 
like kind of give a taxonomy of the PMC, especially like the left leaning PMC in academia and related like institutions and how that like I, I want I want to see that from like on the, on the side of the, how that works within the right wing too, or at least that feels really relevant right now just because of I guess like recent political events. I feel like I don't I want to understand that better because I don't want to be too dismissive or like, or like I don't want to I don't want to misunderstand or like because I I just have impressions of all of these people and. And I think like there's like lots of different people with different level levels of understanding and different motivations taking over different points. So I, I just want, yeah, I mean, I want to try to think about all of this as as we keep reading the book and as events keep happening. Because you know, I'm realizing I I really I don't understand how that like is work how that works <laughs> in America in whatever political system. I I really yeah I don't know. <laughs> All right, well I've got to turn this computer over, um, so I'm gonna have to call it uh, here ish. But, uh, this is great, and um, I don't know if I'll we'll talk. I'll post in the Discord when we're gonna do this again. I'm I don't think here is available next Saturday, but we might just start. In, I don't know. We might just start doing it every Saturday or something. We'll figure it out. We'll figure it out in yeah. the Discord. Yeah, ordered. hopefully we can get it recorded. And thank you for organizing this because I wanted to read this, but I did not want to buy the buy the book. <laughs> oh. <laughs> anyway, yeah, I'm sure everyone who's like looked at the price, you know. <laughs> no, it, uh, I talked to D Dave. Said that I mean Benjamin was here earlier, but Dave said that Benjamin was like, I was like, this book is pricey. Can I just send Benjamin Studebaker <laughs> fifty bucks? And like, and Dave was like, Dave said he's like, Be Benjamin does not care. Like, just download yeah, yeah. it off of, you know, live. Uh, what's it called? Library. Uh, Libgen. Yo ho, mateys. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, but of course, all right. we we all always pay for books because uh, we're good <laughs> and we're not. Yes. We are not radicals and we're not criminals. And we are <laughs> worthy, deserving people. Yeah, man. Uh, Sean, I totally paid for this book. Yeah. Uh, so. Thank you for for heading this up. It is it is great to read this with a group. Uh, it's a great book. Um, thank you. Thank everyone that came. I had a blast, guys. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Have a good one. Bye, Bye everyone. Thanks for coming. We'll let you know when, when it's happening again. Bye. Uh...